so somebody's going to tell me what I did <laughs> to follow John Nichols and get that introduction. That's right. Just, you know, you just let me know. Where is it? Does it? <laughs> oh, there, yeah. Just, we'll talk. We'll talk later. All right. I, uh, I first have a message from Aetna, health insurance company. <laughs> that I received in the mail from Edna, they provide health insurance to, uh, to Donna Smith and others. Uh, Edna does not provide care or guarantee access to health services. For more information, go to edna.com. So my answer is, if they don't provide care or access to health services, what the hell do they do? I think they do something for their shareholders. Yeah. That's the answer. That's the answer. Yeah. So now I have to follow John Nichols. Now, so he told me what I can't talk about, so I'll rearrange my speech. And it, it's a serious, it's a serious issue. We live in a very divided country, in a very polarized country, and at the heart of that polarization is the Affordable Care Act. It's either the proxy, because you don't like the black man who's president, let's be honest, or it's a catalyst for how all of your fears and hatred toward government are born out. And our country is divided by race, as we saw in the response to the killing and murder in Ferguson of an unarmed black teenager. It's being destroyed by class inequality, that literally not only is it that you only get the health care you can afford, you only get the house or the food, or literally your very livelihood based upon your class status. And it's a country riven by gender as well, because all of a sudden women are at the mercy of their insurance company <laughs> as to whether you're going to have a child or not, or get pregnant or anything. And that is unacceptable morally. It's wrong as a matter of justice, but it is the political reality that we face. And so when we hear John and others talk about the broad issues that confront us, like the issue of war and peace, we do have to place our organizing, our movement building work in the context and engage with the broader movement for justice and peace. Because we're not just going to win healthcare justice on its own. We're going to have to have a broad, multiracial social movement that can address inequality and sexism and racism. And that movement is ultimately what's going to transform the country to enable us to win healthcare justice. So that's number one. We have to understand our strategic position in dealing with the country we face as it is riven by these polarized dynamics, that we have to be part of that movement that demands fundamental change, fundamental social change. But secondly, we also have to understand that our greatest challenge is our political challenge. That we don't even have the people, as David Campo said, who support single payer voting for single payer. That's right. Yeah. There is a majority of the California legislature that is on record supporting single payer. Yeah. That's right. And that is true in Minnesota, maybe true in New York. I don't know, Katie, Martha. Uh, I'm in jail, they support you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in jail. That's right. The former governor of Illinois is in jail. I think he supports single payer. Yeah. I know Anthony Weiner supports single payer. But the reality is, is that those supporters of single payer are not voting for single payer, and organizations, individuals who say they support single payer, don't work for it. So that is the second strategic challenge I pose: is that if you support single payer, organize to win single payer. 
If you need to know anything about American politics, it's very helpful to be sitting next to John Dickens. <laughs> yes, and what was the part you made to me, John? So, uh, so that was a very good example. The guy didn't have a chance, took the issue, ran with it, and got elected. That is the kind of, that is the kind of election campaign we need. We have to understand that voting is a tactic, of course, in our, in our strategic arsenal. But it does matter who votes. And it matters, for example, we, there's a project in California called California Calls. And they've identified about a half a million voters, or occasional voters who rarely vote, who, if they were to vote, would support reform of the property tax system in California, known as Prop 13. So they are working with those voters. Canvas, regular contact, communication, and then mobilization to turn them out when that issue comes before the voters. That is the kind of tactical voting approach that we also need. And we can benefit from that electorate, because that electorate is a economic justice electorate. And that's the kind of electorate we need. We also have to address the issue of, look, at most, most people do have health insurance. That's, that's a fact. So we have to make clear that the problems with their health insurance are the result of the insurance companies. Yeah. So what we've done, and Kaiser, let's, let's not forget Kaiser. Who could forget Kaiser? So Kaiser, obviously there are good aspects of that group medical practice model, but it's been highly, highly perverted by the insurance company that calls the shots. Um, those entities we have gone after with the Patient Bill of Rights. It's very important in this period to vilify the insurance companies and make sure that if you have a problem with the ACA, you can't go to the doctor of your choice, that's the insurance company. Denied care, that's the insurance company. We have an opportunity in California, we should look forward in other states to establish regulation of premiums through Prop 45. Yes. This fall, we're going to just spend a lot of time trashing the insurance companies. Yeah. That's going to be fun. and kicking their ass. And that's what we need to do. Now, there are other things that, the, the, if, uh, I was talking to John last night about this, it's certainly possible that there is a fight over the ACA, that maybe actually legislation about the Affordable Care Act may get before the next Congress. What, what should our position be federally? Well, I would suggest that we should talk about the expand, mandatory expansion of Medicaid. Figure out a way to do it. No, it's not a great program, but by God, if you got nothing else, Medicaid is very good. So it's like, thank God for Medicaid, and God help us for Medicaid. But that's the situation we find ourselves in, and it's better to have it than not. Let's also talk about funding for public health and community clinics. That's the infrastructure that we want to promote. And of course, state-based innovation is, as Rebecca and others have talked about, the reality is, in this political dynamic, we're going to have to have states establish single payer if we're going to get it nationally. That may not be how we want to do it, if we can choose. But when you get, when you, you know, as we did in 2009, you meet with um, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, obviously now deceased, who said, hey, I support single payer. I got, I got 10 other senators with me. What do you think we should do? <laughs> well, that's a tough one. All right. But part of the dynamic, of course, was is that people were convinced single payer was politically viable, but the public option was. Yeah. I might say, how did that work out for you? Yeah. <laughs> but that would be nasty, right? <laughs> because the truth is, we need those ACA supporters. Because our task is to consolidate our base first and build new allies. But we have not paid enough attention to consolidating that base. And that base, again, ACA supporters support single payer. They were settling for what they thought they could get. But imagine if we thought we could get single payer. Well, that's a different dynamic. And that's where we have to be. We have to bring in those folks. One of the reasons I'm encouraged by Minnesota, Minnesota in the house. <laughs> 
because ACA supporters in Minnesota, having done a good job of implementing it, are now talking about building a campaign for single payer through the state legislature. That is a very, very important development because those folks who work on the ACA have to be for us. We can't have a divided movement. We can't have a divided single payer movement, but we certainly can't be divided with people who agree with us that health care is a human right and that we should have guaranteed universal health care. So we have to bring in those ACA supporters. As we consolidate the labor movement, there are some of those there. Remaining, I, I don't know how many are left, frankly. But maybe the attorneys for the trust funds, James. <laughs> but we have to bring in those ACA supporters as a key component of consolidating our base. I favor in California going to the ballot first for single payer. Not because I want to do that, but because if we pass something through the legislature, assuming it can get two thirds, the other side would referendum it. So we're on the ballot in California. Just a question of how and when. But what I would like to do, as, as the Washingtonians and Oregonians have discussed, let's all do a ballot measure together. Yes. Right? And then, and then, can't just focus on one state. And at the same time, let's move it to Minnesota so all of a sudden they're in a multi-front war. Whoever said that about California, it's only true about California. It's how Colorado goes, so goes the country. And there are some of us who would be very happy to go to Colorado. What are you talking about? So finally, the nurses talk to a nurse here in the room, and she will tell you that the changes in healthcare delivery and he, and he but look at the nurses I work with, they're like 95% women. I mean, come on. Uh, and it is an honor. <laughs> setting, denial of prescription drugs, nursing toward the laptop instead of the patient, all these things go on every day. And behind a lot of that is this particularly American belief, I think, in technology. <laughs> yes, if we just had electronic medical records, everyone would get preventive care. <laughs> right. And you don't really need to stay in the hospital because a robot can take care of you at home. <laughs> Well, you don't really need a robot, but we'll have this internet connection. <laughs> It'll be fine, don't worry. Put on the blood pressure cuff. So that technology, that technology is potentially going to act, have much more impact, John educated me on this mm. last night, it's gonna have much more impact on how people actually experience healthcare than virtually anything we usually talk about. We have to take very seriously, if technology is a tool used by caregivers in the interest of their clinical judgment, that's one thing. If the technology drives how care is actually delivered and transforms the experience of delivery of patient care, that's a very bad thing. And the assumption in this country is that if there's more tech, the better. We have to understand that these changes in healthcare delivery are key to our winning single payer. That as we consolidate the base, we must also broaden the discussion to those with insurance to say, it's not good enough. What they're doing to your experience of care can only be transformed by a publicly accountable system where we can democratically control how healthcare is financed and administered and that the clinicians can determine how it is delivered. That's what the promise of single payer is.
So we truly do face a crossroads in our movement. I think this conference coming together is an incredible, really powerful sign that we can build the kind of unity and do the base, what I call the base consolidation that we do, and then reach out to those others who haven't been with us, the business owners who will save so much money to be able to guarantee their workers good health care. The Republicans who may not necessarily be afraid of government doing something good. I think there's some. But we ultimately confront that. We ultimately confront that if you can, if the government can do health care well, that it is potentially transformative of our whole experience of social provision of human goods. That our collective, the realization of our collective experience can happen through achieving healthcare justice. That as much as we are a part of these other movements, we bring something unique. And that is something more personal. That our very health is determined by how we organize the healthcare system. That is a profound opportunity. We need to celebrate that opportunity and fully engage politically in order to realize the dream of healthcare justice. Thank you. During my, my 50 years in the labor movement, I've written a number of books, and this is the only one that's uh, sold. Bill uh, Fletcher and I uh, authored Solidarity Divided. Uh, when the Change to Win Coalition um, and the AFL-CIO split. And mainly we wrote the book because uh, we thought both sides were lying. Amen. And uh, that uh, the issue they posed was one of organizing. And I know we only have a couple minutes, um, so I'm just going to share a couple thoughts. Um, one has to do with uh, how you build your local coalitions. And I think that we've had the opportunity to learn from the Occupy movement. We've learned from the Chicago teacher strike. We've learned from Moral Monday and the whole concept of fusion coalitions. Um, but I want to say something that, that I actually, uh, Bill Fletcher and I played a role in. When John Sweeney uh, won election in the AFL-CIO, uh, we helped to craft uh, the original strategy of uh, the AFL-CIO then, and it was called Union Cities. So many of the ideas about community coalitions, about changing the nature of unions, began to, to emerge during that period of time. Unfortunately, I think there are a number of reasons why all of these ideas didn't take hold and we didn't move forward in the way that we all wanted it to. But specifically, I think some of the things we've learned is that we still have to organize workers. I think that one of the things is, is that we can't just leave that to institutional unions. Workers have to be organized in many fashions, given the changing nature of society. And one of the things that we've learned is we have to make communities stakeholders in the outcomes of these elections. But most important, most of our coalition building has to be organized to take power. As both uh, John and Michael have pointed out, and many other uh, speakers today have pointed out many of the same things. And we have to organize when we take power to change the discourse of greed and self-interest to one of compassion and the belief that a new world is possible. So, in this process, I want to speak specifically to what I think needs to happen to bring... In, in Oregon, we passed uh, the only um, tax the rich uh, legislation in the past 10 years. And it was called Prop 66 and 67.
1867. And there, the unions united, put $6 million into the campaign, and we beat uh, the combined interests of the Koch brothers and all of the major corporations in the United States. If we could build that same coalition, if the unions got behind universal health care in the same manner, we would have universal health care in Oregon now. That's right. So two things seem to happen. One, there's the normal approach where you go to the executive board and you make your plea and you talk to the political director and you schmooze and you do all that stuff. That's still a component of what we have to do. But what we've seen in Oregon is that we also have a vibrant movement based around numerous issues. And it's a low-wage worker movement. And we saw it happen nationally around the 15 Now campaign. It's still happening. And when I talk about the notion of fusion, I'm talking about most unions. I don't care how much they want to tout the, the power of their TAF Hartley or their multi-employer programs, or even some of the uh, public sector unions which allegedly have good health care. Most every union I know in Oregon has a certain percentage of people who do not have health care, who are carrying a union card and do not have health care. What I propose is that we build those low-wage worker movements, combine 50 now, combine uh, uh, our health care demands for universal health care, combine uh, earn sick leave, and make a whole campaign around that that then puts pressure on the union from the bottom up to make it happen. So we're doing our political cruising and we're putting pressure from the law. The other thing I suggest to you is that you look at your coalitions and you look at your communities and you see if there's a match. If there isn't a match, then what you have to do is create bridges. Because the communities of color that I have anything to do with, which are African American, Asian, Latino, all want universal health care. Right. So we make those coalitions, we tie them together, we combine the pressure on the unions and get them to provide their institutional power and resources to make this movement happen. Thank you. Our young people are giving us the opportunity to reclaim our country. What fools down there terrorizing babies that they can't have refuge in this country? Whose damn country is it anyway? Hands up, don't shoot, is about an indictment that our children have seen and faced and they have made us place in the sand and say, you will not step over there. Hands up, don't shoot. They have also said, you will no longer tread over us. Brother, did you know where Dan Scott was buried? Only four miles from the epicenter that is happening in America today. We don't have to create a new movement. We just have to know how to embrace the freedom fighters that are stepping forward, braving gas, tears, and tyranny. And they're stepping forward for each and every one of us. Hands up, don't shoot, has got to be a part. Every one of those workers are fighting poverty, fighting the injustice of having no access to health care. And they are also ready and willing to fight for the future of this country. I heard a gentleman earlier today, an immigrant, with all that fire, and I'm like, hell, let's run him for president, because I don't know who else is standing for we the people. Hands up! Don't shoot! That's our movement! You don't have to create one. You gotta embrace them. That's the youngsters who are not afraid. They've been thrown out by capitalism. 
They ain't got a problem with it. I learned a little something, John, as a, on, on just as a babe in this working from civil rights to labor rights to all of our human rights. It was about the necessity of pulling the courts, doing our work in the courts on public policy and in the streets. And when those things are combined, we get the kind of leverage that allows us to elevate the values of our human rights over these damn corporations and begin to let our people breathe again and be able to heal. Hands up, don't shoot. That is your movement. It's not somebody else's. And if we want to talk about broadening this effort for our effort to win health care, then it's got to be the young crusade. I got to tell you, it's got to be this, because I'm loving all of y'all. We've been in the trenches a long time, but only, only when the young understand this is their effort going forward. Now, we women have a special role, because it seems the Supreme Court got special love for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what kind of way they can handle our bodies. I say for we women, hands up, don't shoot! <laughs> we need a broad movement that says, we understand that the youngest, the youngest amongst us, our, our, our children that are at risk, you are that movement. So in fact, America is changing, but the dream defenders, the, the brothers and sisters who are occupiers, they're not waiting for us. Anybody to jump into the governor's mansion in Florida and sit there to the fools, talk to them. That's what I'm talking about. We don't have to create it, we gotta embrace it. And we gotta do something else that we like to do here in Oakland. Teaching as we find. Right. Right. Few y'all might be familiar with that. Now see, a few people may not like that because we like to talk about how the damn broke breakfast program was a good damn thing. <laughs> and we need to expand that, but check this out. We like to talk about how when they teach us about well, we gotta cut this program because it's just no money. Well, when I looked at, Law at Wall Street last, yeah. and I looked at what my city was willing to give to Wall Street last, this some damn body got some money. In fact, we got a lot of abundance up here in Oakland and all throughout this country. But we, the people, have to redirect. And so I heard, Michael, that the nurses got a little program that they sponsor called the Financial Transaction Tax. That's right. <laughs>
then my thing is let's run their butt up out of here and right. have some folks that handle their vision. I'm not a woman that likes to mince words. I believe that you need to come to this, but you also, if you have the means in your organization, co-sponsor. You know, co-sponsor means y'all have to put some dough in so I can get the broke folk who have nothing to be able to be there and also be in that room to, you know, organize and agitate. But we're gonna have them here five to seven days, Mike. They need to be talking to us about how this hell they're going through in Michigan and how we have to break the silence on that. That is a part of our movement for health care. That's my job. And then the last thing, here's some of y'all, water is human rights. I know that we have a nation, we believe also in promoting the papers of independent class politics, which is a People's Tribune. We got a bunch of them out there. I got a few youngsters here, young heads who are handling their business here. You need to read, read it, write for it. If you want to catch some, go there. And if you want to know some more about it, stop by our table. But I'm so serious. I'm so excited about this work. And I'm just mad I can't transfer, you know, like a Whovian and be back in time. But you know what? Hands up, don't shoot is what I'm all about, baby. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. All right. How many here are from the South? All right. Stand up. Stand up. Right. Who can tell me what income? what income level you need to have in Mississippi to qualify for Medicaid. Anybody know? It's $6,200 a year for a family of four. There is no southern state where a single adult or even a couple without children are eligible for Medicaid. Below 138%, above 133%. So this struggle to expand Medicaid for all really made me very sad yes. and very angry. Here it is, I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years. Right. Talking about, what you call it, Ubers? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Go back in time. Go back in time. Um, the, the, you know, the fact that in 2014, we're talking about expanding one of the weakest public health insurance programs unequal that was a deal basically negotiated with the South that reinforced states' rights at the same time Medicare was passed is a crime. Yeah. That's a crime. But it's a battle we have to get into. Let me ask you another question. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Hey, Who said that? Hey, hey, thank you. Got a lot of historians here. How many of us know what our history is as fighters in the healthcare movement. It started with that. Fannie Lou Hamer had a Mississippi hysterectomy, and that's what they did to a lot of African American women in the state of Mississippi. You go in for whatever kind of health care or if you had an abdominal problem or something like that, and you come out with a hysterectomy. Thousands of African American women were sterilized in the South. Thousands of Puerto Rican women have been sterilized. It, is over the period of years. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment, yes. people know about that. But I want to share, I want, I want to try to honor what he's saying I was supposed to say. Um, <laughs> a little bit about our history, okay? How many people here have been involved with, because I see some great, more great heads, the Medical Committee for Human Rights? That's right. All right. Okay. Where did that come from? It came from, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. When, during the Freedom Summer 50 years ago, two doctors, Dr. Robert Smith, an African-American doctor in the state of Mississippi, and well, Walter Mill preceded that, that's a long history, I can't get into all that, and another doctor, Alvin Poussin, were called in to provide health care for civil rights workers that were being beaten up, okay? And when they got there, they realized very, very soon it wasn't just about that. It was about everybody in the state, everybody in the movement not having any access to health care whatsoever, right? And today we see a lot of the same, a lot of the same pieces of the issue. But MCHR, what it did was it connected with these movement struggles in a very, very real way. I want to try to move this along because I really want time for people to talk and ask questions and formulate things. Um, one, of the, one of the things that's been happening to me in the last five days 
It's been hands up, don't you. I've been getting calls from this network around the country saying, can you bring healthcare professionals to Ferguson? Can you help us here? Can you bring people that are trained in healing and the healing arts? Can you bring them here? One year ago, this summer, I was marching. Who's from Florida in here? Where are my Florida people? Okay. All right. I was marching with a march in uh, toward Sanford, Florida, around the Zimmerman verdict for the murder of Trayvon Martin. And I was providing some of the basic first aid and, and necessities that we have. The, the, the point of that is what's different then and now? And I see a big difference. And it's not about having an African-American black president. It's about the polarization of the society. Yes. I mean, it is about, it's not just there's, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It's about the rich are rich because the yes. poor are poor. Okay? And that's exactly what's happening to our healthcare system right now. You know, it used to be, well, I think the evolution of healthcare in this country was, and I think Michael, somebody said that before, you needed healthcare to have a productive workforce, right? You couldn't, you, know, you needed literacy, education, public education, to have people working in factories that could read directions and, 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 the, and the like, right? Well, what happens when that's gone? In other words, when that role is gone, right? When I first worked into, uh, walked into SIC, I'm a registered nurse. Um, I'm a staff nurse. I'm a member of NNOC. And a member actually have asked me to, and we don't have any collective bargaining, by the way. You know, not in Georgia, which is where I'm from. Um, in, in that. I walked into SICU, and I, I, I've been working on the floors, on trauma floors. And I walked in and I looked up at this computer thing, and it was, it was a, well, it's called a, um, help me, I'm trying to remember because I've worked in an outpatient clinic for so many years, um, central line monitoring, right? And it had all of what was going on, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your fluid balance, your oxygenation level, all that in your mind. I was, oh my God, I can't believe this. Now this is, this is about 20 years ago, I and mean, I was really amazed. And I stood back and I thought, you know, I bet what's next is they're going to tell us what to do. <laughs> and that's exactly what's happening now. And I want to raise up NNU's campaign, ask for a nurse, request a nurse, because that couldn't be truer. Yeah. More people are going to How many of you two more things? I want to, I want to leap ahead. And, and I usually don't read stuff. But but this is, I mean, I'm reading, but I usually don't, I usually don't, yeah, because yeah, I agree with this, teach if you struggle, that's important. I want to read, this is the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, okay? It's, uh, you know, whatever the local paper, you know, it's the, it's the big daily paper, thank you, John. That's, that's what it is. It's a piece of junk, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but every now and then, you, you, get, you get this, this stuff in here, and you're like, oh my God. If they're saying it, I better say it. So, so bear with me for just a minute. Um, okay, all right, here it goes. Technological innovations have been throwing people out of jobs for centuries, but they eventually created more work and greater wealth than they destroyed. Witness Detroit. By the way, we owe so much of everything yes. to Detroit. We yes. need to talk more about the water crisis. And again, yes. Yes. thank you, NNU, for being here. Because that, I mean, water, if the access to water is not an issue of healthcare, what is? I mean, what is? Okay, so back on the glasses. Ford, this author and a software engineer, thinks there's reason to believe that this time it will be different. He sees virtually no end to the inroads of computers in the workplace. Eventually, he says, software will threaten the livelihoods of doctors, lawyers, registered nurses, and other highly skilled professionals, okay? Peter Lindbergh, an economist at University of California, Davis, 
said that the computer is more destructive than innovations in the Industrial Revolution because the pace at which it is upending industry makes it hard for people to adapt. Occupations that provided middle class lifestyles for generations can disappear in a couple of years. And that's exactly what's happening. I mean, I'm old enough, and, and even the young, younger people here, I mean, you go into a supermarket, there used to be a grocery store clerk there, right? You know, when they, you know that was there. Now there's one clerk for 10 do-it-yourself lines, right? I mean, we see this in everything, from the robots that took the jobs out of Detroit to, you know, to the hospitals that we're working in, to standing in front of the computer and looking at the computer when you should be looking at the patient. And, you know, and, and finally, templates that force you to, into things that have little or nothing to do with the healthcare that you're delivering. Am I right, Bruno? Yeah. So, but, I mean, the, the, the last thing I want to say, and I'm not going to, okay. all right. The last thing I want to say is that this technology, and I think Michael sort of said this, can be liberating, right? I mean, we have now this tremendous antagonism really in society where healthcare, right, has to be bought, yes. right? Well, what happens if you no longer have an income with which to purchase something, right. right? I mean, there is a fundamental break within this system. And I think that the ACA, in a lot of ways, codified that about employment-based health insurance. So we have to now Actually, when we're talking about building for power, we have to start thinking about the distribution of the goods and necessities and the basic things of life based on our needs, not on whether we can afford it or not. Because that's what the future is saying for. As we look to the 2016 elections, all right, now everybody in here knows, and, and certainly these panelists know better than I do, that, that healthcare is obviously going to be an issue, and they're going to screw it up, and like this, and they're going to We need to use that time, because you know, the country will be in a political conversation, right? I mean, it's elections, they're always in a political conversation. We need to use that time to build our political force and say, yes. what is it we want, what do we need, and how do we work together to achieve that goal? Because it's a vision of a life that reclaims our country and really makes it universal, comprehensive health care for all. Thank you. We are a humble state in Vermont, but we will take it because I can tell you, yes. Um, I actually, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, so, to, as you heard, I'm Keisha Rahm. I, have, I started in the legislature when I was 21, um, and I am now 28. And I say that, I say that only because um, I feel older than some of the panelists. Um, first, I want to honor all of you. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about young people, but I can say as a young elected official, um, we stand on your shoulders. All right. You know, you have um, showed us the way. I wouldn't be a 28-year-old legislator on the Ways and Means Committee in Vermont if it wasn't for all the work you did, and in particular calling out women who fought and people of color who fought to make me, as a, as a woman of color, able to serve in the Vermont legislature. So thank you. wonderful Donna Smith and the incredible Dr. Paul Song. Um, it, sounds like, it sounds like you have heard from them or you will hear from them, so I won't take too long to honor them, but I will say we all um, shared a panel together at Netroots Nation that, that Paul and the Courage Campaign put together. And at Netroots Nation, our progressive, standard-bearing conference, we were the only panel on universal health care. We were the only health care panel wow. at the whole event. Um, and so it was, we were small but mighty, and for the first time, you know, I have to say, I've been in the legislature for six years, we've been working on single payer, and being here today and being in Detroit with those folks, it's the first time I really felt part of the movement. Right. We're a small state in Vermont, 
Um, and you have people like, such as yourself in California and Colorado and Montana and Oregon and all over the country doing work that also bolsters us in Vermont. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to honor Matt McGrath from the Vermont Workers Center who's in the back. Um, I was just I was just at a small round table that we were doing in my district in Burlington where he had you know, his grassroots supporters holding me accountable and saying, what about this and what about this? And that's not good enough and I need that. We all need that as politicians to hold ourselves accountable. And speaking of holding myself accountable, um, there's someone really special in the room. I told you I was from California and my father is here, who lives up here. Who's your dad? Um, he's here. Well, he took over an Irish pub in Los Angeles, <laughs> and, he pub. and that's where I was raised. And he took a lot of immigrant workers who had, no, you know, was their first job, had no other option, um, and helped them on their path. And so he's taught me a lot. And he's my biggest critic and biggest supporter at the same time. And um, so you don't have to worry about me being held accountable. <laughs> Um, so a little bit, uh, just a little bit about myself, because I think it helps illustrate my journey and, and my experience as a legislator. Um, we're, we're a citizens' legislature in Vermont, so unlike California, where it's kind of your full-time job, um, we're in a state where it's it's essentially a part-time job, even though we try we have to serve our constituents year-round. Um, when I started in the legislature, I was a preschool teacher, and um, I didn't I didn't have health care. My mother works for the UC system here in California. And they had just dropped kids off of the UC um, healthcare system. That was Arnold Schwarzenegger as down here. Um, and so I lost my healthcare as a senior when I was knocking on doors for my campaign and teaching preschool. Um, and so, so I really felt the struggle of what do I? I don't even feel comfortable or safe crossing the street. I don't know um, what's going to happen if I get sick. And I was working with kids who were always sick, so it was, it was a real struggle. Um, I then moved to being a, um, a legal advocate for victims of domestic violence. And so some of you may know from the nonprofit world, I was definitely underinsured. Um, it felt like I was working for my health care most of the time and helping people who I felt like, you know, I was one accident away from, from being in their shoes in terms of their access to resources. I now work for the city of Burlington, and for those of you who may not know, that's where Bernie Sanders got his start in politics. <laughs> because of progressive leaders like Bernie Sanders who gave us a sliding scale um, health care system in the city. So, you know, it's not that the mayor and the custodian cleaning city hall will have the same cost for health care. It's a complete sliding scale based on your income and how much you make for the, from the city. So it's a model for the state as we try to do our work. Um, so I, I want to say, you know, you've heard a lot about states where people have a super majority and they're not doing as much with it. Um, I, I'm, really, I'm really proud of the state of Vermont. We have a super majority with, with our progressive colleagues as well. My district mate is a progressive. I'm a Democrat, and we've endorsed each other, and we work together. And um, I've served three years on the Labor and Housing Committee. I, I'm now in my third year. I finished my third year on the Ways and Means Committee. And um, you know, we have really tried to be a leader in the country um, you know, and worked with states like California and other states to try to figure out how we could support one another in this effort um, to bring progressive issues to the table when we know the federal government is not going to be doing that anytime soon. Um, we were the first state to do civil unions. We were the first state to do marriage equality without a court requirement. We just did GMO labeling. Um, yeah. you know, we, Immigrant driver's licenses, we just passed universal pre-K, and we just passed one of the highest minimum wage bills in the country. So <laughs> and one of our I'm sorry. How much is this? It's minimum wage. No, the minimum wage is gonna go to ten fifty. Pretty good. And so I, I was part of the effort to do twelve fifty to fifteen dollars. We didn't quite get what we wanted, but you know, we're happy Seattle and other other communities are leading the way and we'll eventually increase it. Um, we are also trying to lead in healthcare, and that's why I'm here today. Um, what we did pass is a bill called Act 48, and it basically committed the legislature and the administration to moving forward on universal health care. Um, but we have some frightening off roads before we get there. So, right now, we're basically saying um, we want to get to single payer, we want everybody to be in the system, and we want everyone to have coverage regardless of employment. Um, we want the system to work so that it contains costs and, and meets people's basic needs. Um, but, you know, legislators are still getting scared. We're about to go into 
um, a, a basically in the end of this year we're going to figure out what the benefit package looks like and it's going to be approved by an independent body that we've set up called the Green Mountain Care Board. And even that will be a fight and it's something that we can't take for granted because there's a lot of us who want to make sure that dental is covered, that vision is covered, that, I mean, you know, all, what are called alternative medicines that existed for, for thousands of years in other countries are included, long-term care. And so, you know, we know that the fight is not over just with the benefit package that, that we've created. And then in January 2015, um, we are going to have the administration propose a financing package for how we're going to pay for this. And what we know is that we have to raise $2 billion and it sounds like a lot of money. It would be more money than we've ever raised through our tax system. We're a small state. I know that might be a mistake in the California budget, but Vermont, we, you know, we, we raised maybe one and a half billion off of our income tax. So this is more tax money than we've ever raised. Um, but at the same time, what we know is that it's not new money. It's money that is being squeezed out of people who can't afford it. Um, and it's, it's not based on who can pay, and, and it's already, you know, people feel they're, they're nickel and dime in the system, but they have no one to complain to because of insurance companies. And so we're trying to take that money and make it public money to support yeah. what we're doing. Um, thank you. And I think, what, I think one of our challenges um, that, that we take very seriously is the message around all of this. Because, you know, we, we have to remember that when when we leave it up to the market, it doesn't work. And also that right now we have the exchange and the ACA, which has papered over a broken healthcare system. Um, and it's really not getting us what we need. And there are three things that I think are really important when I tell my constituents, why are we doing this? Even though they all feel quite upended by the exchange, which didn't work for a lot of them. Why should I listen to government again? Why should I submit to what you're doing again? Um, one is, as I said before, healthcare cannot be tied to employment. It means the people who need it most get the least access. And we know that the exchange is not really fixing um, We know that the current system as it is does not support primary care the way it needs to. Um, you know, that all of the money goes to tertiary care. And so, so as, as was said, you know, um, providers are forced to send people to tertiary care that might otherwise be able to just access primary care get better care, get what they needed. Um, you know, I have a doctor in my neighborhood who I, I, my district includes our major hospital, the University of Vermont Medical Center. And um, I had a doctor come up to me when I was out campaigning and say, you know, I'm a podiatrist and my deal with feet and knees and foot problems. And when I want to, when I tell somebody that, you know, you're, you would be better off getting, um, physical therapy than, than surgery. You have a knee problem, you know, if you do physical therapy, you'll, you'll be a lot better off, it'll be less invasive, you'll be more likely to recover. They want to put people more towards physical therapy than, than towards um, surgery. The hospital comes at the end of the year and says, you didn't do enough surgeries. Your pay is getting done. I, I didn't learn that until a doctor told me that, and, and it makes me feel like, wow, this effort has to change that. We are, you know, we're not giving people the right care at the right time. Um, in the right place. We're telling them they have to go into surgery because otherwise their doctor's pay is going to get done. That's ridiculous. And tied to that, we, we need a system that actually contains costs. We can't keep throwing our money at big hospitals and big insurance companies without getting better outcomes for people. Um, and we, you know, we feel like if we don't have single payer, we're not able to do that. your own state and your state legislators. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm 28. Um, I tried to learn a lot. I'm on the committee that's going to be deciding how we finance the system. Um, you know, I wrote my notes on a, a, yeah, um, um, a toward equitable financing of Green Mountain Care report that came from the Vermont Workers Center. We need information. We need grassroots support. We need, you know, the hacks and the people who know how to win an election when we all really put our, stick our necks out for this to help us do this and do it right and make sure it's as progressive as it can be and then help us win again in 2016 so the rest of the country doesn't say, oh wow, you know, Vermont stuck its neck out and lost its head. Right. Um, you know, we need your help to go first so California can go next, so Colorado can go next, so Montana can go next, so other states can do what we are trying to do next month. All other states, Minnesota, yeah, yeah. all other states. I was just there last week, it's a great state. Um, so, you know, that that is, we're, we're strapped into a roller coaster in Vermont. In 2015, we're going to get our financing plan. 
we're going to try to make it serve the most people, and there's going to be people who try to just chip away at it. We, I want to thank the Worker Center again because when we passed Act 48 and just tried to set up the framework, the first thing that happened was the Senate introduced an amendment to try to take migrant farm workers out of the bill. And it was the Worker Center and other grassroots supporters who said, everybody in, or this doesn't work. Thank you so much for having me.